Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 per cent show about women reshaping our world coming up. The controversial issue of how some Muslim women and girls dress captures the headlines here in France. Once again, the spotlight is on clothing in schools. Also, the missing women of Peru. Thousands disappear each year, primarily due to human trafficking, prostitution and gender violence, with their mothers now taking to the streets demanding justice. And a kick for equality, the nuns of Kathmandu who teach women and girls Kung Fu as an act of empowerment. But we begin here in France, where a government moved to ban the abaya. A traditional dress worn by some Muslim women and girls in public schools has reignited debate. This over the nation's approach to secularism, or laïcité as it's known in French. And just like previous controversies over the veil or the bikini, the issue centres largely around women's clothing. It's also divided progressive politicians, as Alison Sargent reports. <laughs> kicking off the French school year with another national debate about secularism. In one of his first major acts as education minister, Gabriel Attal announced that the long, ample dress known as the abaya and its masculine equivalent, the kamis, would be banned in public schools. Joining veils, kippahs and large crosses as religious symbols considered conspicuous and banished under a 2004 law. Over the past few months, infringements on secularism have considerably grown with the wearing of religious garments like the abaya and kamis that have reappeared and have sometimes taken hold in certain schools. This choice is a choice of our values and a refusal of communitarianism. But French Muslim groups say the abaya is simply a traditional garment, not a religious symbol, a sentiment echoed by some of the young girls wearing it. When you wear it, you sort of think of yourself as a princess, like Middle Eastern women. So frankly, it's not even a religious garment. It's a dress that all girls wear, both veiled and non-veiled. So it's a bit of a problem. But well, we have to adapt. The ban has been welcomed by politicians on the right, but has divided those on the left. While many from the socialist and communist parties salute the move as in line with France's secular values, Politicians from the far-left France Unbowed Party say the ban is the latest move to stigmatize Muslims, particularly young women, under the guise of secularism. And former Green Party leader Cécile Duflo posted a photo of a designer dress, pointing out the difficulty of distinguishing it from an abaya, an ambiguity many say opens the door to discrimination. You cannot implement such a ban without implementing racial profiling as well. Because will a non-Muslim wearing a maxi dress bought at the same, in the same retailer as a Muslim one will be prevent him from wearing it? Is it an abaya depending on the origin of the person or the supposed religion? Thorny questions that educators are still largely on their own to resolve. Meanwhile, the one thing many do agree on is that debate over the abaya has distracted from more important issues like lack of teachers, social segregation, and the impact of high cost of living on students and families. Now to Peru, where 60% of those who disappear each year are women. More than 11,000 women were reported missing in the country in 2022, the majority of them teenagers. Most disappearances are linked to either human trafficking, prostitution or domestic violence. Their mothers having taken to the streets demanding justice, as our team on the ground report. Where is Shirley Villanueva Rivera? Several times a year, these activists and her mother, Norma, gather in front of Lima's Supreme Court of Justice. They're calling for more action to find Shirley, a 24-year-old student who disappeared in 2017 after an evening with friends. We demand that the Lima courts reopen Shirley's case and that justice be done. We will fight to the bitter end. In Peru, 60% of the disappeared are women and half of them are minors. 
Some disappearances are voluntary, but most are linked to human trafficking networks, prostitution and domestic violence. An uncertainty that Rosario Aiba knows only too well. Her daughter disappeared on the 13th of August 2016. Salseret was a mother of two and a student. The case became symbolic of the issue in the country. Her partner called me around a quarter to nine to tell me that Sol had left. I said, what do you mean she's gone? Where is she gone? He said he didn't know and that she'd taken her clothes and her bag. It was the start of an interminable wait for Rosario and her husband. A week passed before the police agreed to raise the alarm. Then it took a year and a half to geolocate her daughter's mobile phone. No action was taken. They had to wait two more years before the investigation was relaunched. And then, a revelation. Salsa's SIM card had been used by her sister-in-law. She eventually confessed to the murder and told them where to find the remains of the body. Salsa's brother-in-law and sister-in-law were eventually convicted of murder and her husband found to be an accomplice. The police need the will to investigate and to have patience like we had with them. When they told me she left on her own or she's found another boyfriend, I said, whatever, just look for her. In 2019, legislation was passed in Peru imposing a protocol for the disappearance of vulnerable people, including requiring searches to be launched within a few hours and expanded police facilities. But NGOs like Amnesty International complained that the rules are not being sufficiently followed. We need to improve the search for missing women. And to improve that, we need a special unit with people who are entirely dedicated to this work. In other countries, they have succeeded. Guatemala, for example, has a special search system. It's something we could learn from here, in Peru. Another problem is that the National Register for Disappearances is too imprecise and not up to date. In Peru, less than half of the missing are ever found. These mothers are therefore continuing to demonstrate alongside feminist groups in the hope that one day there will be fewer disappearances and that their calls for justice will be heard. And finally, it's an image that resembles a feminist take on a Bruce Lee movie. Close to Kathmandu, a group of Buddhist nuns, mostly from poor backgrounds in India and Tibet, pray, dance and learn martial arts, just like men, as this fraudster report shows. Three, four, five. At dawn in this Buddhist monastery, the nuns gather in formation, swords drawn, with a stern look on their faces. This morning, like every morning, they are practicing Kung Fu for two hours. A surprising routine for these women, who preach non-violence and are often destined for a life of meditation and prayer. In the whole Himalayan region, the nuns are uh, not allowed to do the physical exercises and all, but we are the first to break this uh, vows and come out from this. It's not like Kung Fu is for only the fighting, but it's really helped to do our fitness, exercise and all. Their day begins at 3 a.m. They gather to chant prayers, a daily ritual for all practicing Buddhists. At most convents, men usually come to lead the services, but here, it's the nuns that take on this role. I came here when I was nine years old. Before that, I had never seen a nun lead prayer. I'm very happy and proud to have this opportunity. These nuns are from a particular lineage in Buddhism that started giving women more power in the 1990s. As a result, today these nuns can practice religious dances, learn sacred texts, and do construction work. 
a job that would have been out of their reach if they had stayed with their families. Construction is something that is often reserved for men, but now I can do it. I'm so happy to be able to do this as a woman, especially as a nun. A feminist mindset is instilled in these nuns from an early age. The youngest ones practice Kung Fu every day under the watchful eye of 23-year-old Chigme Yang Chen Gamo. She's lived at this monastery since she was 10. Past years, there is like every um, parents tell that girls can't do this, girls can't speak very loudly and such of things. So in our nunnery, in the young girls, we teach that we can do anything, you know. So we can compare what they can't. We can be more strong with doing Kung Fu. So I think it's like... Uh, <laughs> gender equality also. It's a cause that the 300 nuns continue to fight for. They want to honor the surname they share, Jigme, which means the one without fear. And that's all for this edition. We'd love to hear your suggestions for the 51%, so do get in touch via Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. And you can catch our previous episodes on our website. So until our next show, bye for now.